want to talk to you today about the doctrine of eminence. Okay, um, this is going to be a very detailed study. Uh, this is something that I have been teaching, um, that the catching up of the body of Christ is an imminent thing and whatever else. And it, I've, it was something that I was taught, and so I kind of passed it on. But um, examining the scriptures and things and some other arguments and whatever else, which I'll be getting into, um, we'll be seeing what the scriptures actually teach. And uh, I believe in the catching up being before the time of Jacob's trouble. I will always believe that. I will always teach that. But the question is the timing. What is the timing of that? That's what this study is about. Um, we're going to get into it here. Uh, just to, to say what it is, the doctrine of eminence is that Jesus Christ can come back at any time. Now we're going to examine the scriptures and see if that's actually so. All right. Uh, you know, eminent people that believe in the eminence of the return of Jesus Christ say that Jesus could have come back in Paul's day, that he could have come back during the times when the New Testament wasn't even completed yet, which is really kind of strange when you think about it. You know, that Paul was looking for Jesus and because of a few scriptures, or there's one in particular that they go to, which we'll be looking at. And they say, you know, Jesus could have come in Paul's day before John received the book of Revelation. Kind of odd, but uh, we're going to look about this, all right? And to say, a lot of people would say, well, if you get rid of imminence, then it means that you believe that Jesus will come back on a certain date. Um, well, I do. I do believe that Jesus is going to come back on a certain date, and it's known only to the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ knows when he is going to catch the body of Christ up. Um, he has it pre-planned. Okay, let's look at the scriptures. Philippians chapter 3. Turn in your King James Bible to Philippians chapter 3. There's been so many of my beliefs over the years that I get challenged on them, and I think, well, that's, of course that's the way it is because that's how I was taught. Um, and then I actually start to examine the Scriptures, and I think, yeah, wait a second, uh, this isn't lining up anymore with how I was taught. So um, we're going to look at the Scriptures that would support an imminent rapture, and I'm going to show you why they don't work for it could have happened in Paul's day. All right, Philippians chapter 3. These are the ones that they will turn you to, imminence people will turn you to. Philippians 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. What's the key words there? We look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was looking for the Savior. Therefore, the rapture is imminent because Paul was looking for it. And Jesus could have come back in Paul's day. See how they do it? Uh, no, it's just a truth. This is a general truth right here for any Christian. All right, We're looking for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We wait for him and things like that, the redemption of our bodies. That doesn't mean that we're all going to be alive when it happens. There are people that have died in the Lord. They're, you know, they're dead and they're buried and they're waiting for the redemption of their body. You know, the corruptible puts on incorruption. They're waiting for that. But any Christian can make this statement and say, we are looking for Jesus Christ. Even the dead, the souls that are in heaven, I believe, they're looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. It's not saying that Paul was looking for Jesus in his day. He was just stating a general truth that anybody who's saved is going to think about that day of redemption. When the dead in Christ rise first, and we which are alive and remain call up together to meet them, to meet the Lord in the air. You know? That's what's going on there. Doesn't mean that Paul was looking for, you know, that he was thinking that the rapture was going to happen. And I'll say this, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll come back to that. I was going to make another point, but that would be getting ahead of myself. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. What are the key words there for an eminence teacher? 
we, verse, uh, verse 17, then we which are alive and remain. Paul is saying, we which are alive. Oh, he was waiting. He see, he's seeing that Jesus could come back in his day, so it's imminent. See what they'll do? Again, Paul stating a basic general truth there for the body of Christ. He's not saying it has to be him that's in that. And I've actually heard, <clears throat> there was actually a Jewish rabbi I listened to the one time and uh, online here on YouTube, and he actually was saying that Paul was a false prophet because he was using the eminent scriptures, one of these, you know, this being one of them, to prove that Paul was looking for Jesus in his day, therefore Paul was falsely prophesying and was a false prophet, which would be true. If Paul really believed in the eminence doctrine, then he was a false prophet because he was saying Jesus is coming back in our day. We are looking for him. We're expecting him to come back. If that's true, if that's what he actually meant, if you're taking it out of what he's really trying to say here, if he's saying himself, including himself, then he was a false prophet. I mean, if I say um, the Lord's going to come back before the end of this sermon, I am looking for the Lord to come back before the end of this sermon. And I get to the end of the sermon and it gets edited on my computer and rendered and then it goes and gets uploaded onto YouTube and you all see it and the Lord still hasn't come, and come back. Guess what? I gave a false prophecy. You see? So by saying, if you're an eminence teacher and you say, Paul was expecting Jesus in his day, he was looking for the Lord in his day, you're saying that Paul's a false prophet. You need to think about that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, another one that they'll use. Turn back to the first chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. To wait for his Son from heaven. See, they're looking for Jesus. It's the imminent rapture. It could have happened at any time. No, no. Again, general truth, the body of Christ whether dead or alive, you're waiting to see Jesus Christ. That doesn't determine the timing of it. It's not saying it could happen at any time. There's prophecies that are giving, given, which we will be looking at here, where Paul's, you can clearly see Paul's not contradicting himself unless you're an eminence believer. You know, Paul is giving, you know, we'll be looking at these other scriptures where Paul is saying about things in the last days, in the end times. He's not saying that he's in it. All right, we'll see about that. But again, you can see one of the scriptures that's used by an eminence believer. They're, they're waiting for his son from heaven. Oh, that's what they're expecting him in, in their day. Well, we'll get back to that too. But now the big one, Romans chapter 13. This is the big one that the uh, eminence believers will go to. The, the rapture could have happened at any time throughout church history. Which we'll look about that in just a little bit here. But the... Uh, it could happen anytime because Paul was looking for him, so we should look for him anytime and whatever else. Romans 13, verse 11 through 14. And when we get done with this study, you'll see the danger of this eminence doctrine. So, and I have a confession or two to make. <laughs> Romans 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Hmm. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. And if you look at Peter Ruckman's commentary, he literally says, verse 12, the day is at hand. That means Paul was looking for Jesus in his day. No. No. What's the context here? Let us walk honestly as in the day. Okay? 
Jesus Christ talks about, ye are the light of the world. We are of the day. We're not of the night. Compare this over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which we'll be going to later. We won't go there right now, but compare the two. We are of the day. The lost world's of the night. It's not saying, oh, well, uh, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ here, the, the, the day of the rapture, it's at hand. Again, if, Paul, if that's what Paul meant, then Paul was a false prophet. It's just as simple as that. It doesn't work. The day is at hand. I mean, think, think about what he's saying here. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Okay, if that's about the time that they're living in, then Paul's awfully stupid. The night is far spent. Here we are, you know, just a few years away from when Jesus went back up to heaven. The night is far spent. No, no, he's not talking about the, the, what would be called the, by many the church age. I would call it the, the time of the body of Christ. Um, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about those works of darkness, the, the, the people that are of the night. We are of the day. Don't tell me, well, no, he's talking about the day of the, of, the, of the catching up of the body of Christ. That makes no sense at all. And then, like I said, if, he, if that's what Paul meant, then he's a false prophet. But let me show you another way to, another thing here, another proof against this whole thing, this imminence thing. Oh, that Paul was saying, he's, the, the day's at hand. He's expecting to see the Lord in his day. Is that true? No, it's not. 1 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> you have to compare Scripture with Scripture. What cults like to do is they like to say they'll, they'll seize upon one Scripture and then they'll build a whole huge big thing off of that. You always have to compare Scripture with Scripture. Rightly divide the word of truth. All right? And that's not just the Pauline epistles too. Now I'm dispensational, certainly, but I'm not hyper-dispensational. Hyper-dispensationalists say Paul only. And they even reject a lot of the part of the book of Acts. And say nobody was really in Christ until Paul showed up. Well, that's stupid. You know, because Paul himself talks about, you know, names some believers and he says, who were in Christ before me. So, there's some problems there. But I'm a dispensational preacher. But that doesn't mean I ignore the rest of the Bible. There's doctrines that line up regardless of who it's written to. Old Testament, you know, before the law, under the law. Uh, the law and the prophets are until John. Since that time, the kingdom of heaven is, pre is preached. There's different seven different dispensations, and there are things that cross those dispensational lines. But you have to rightly divide certain things. And if you're going and you're saying, I'm going to base my imminence doctrine off of Romans 13, uh, that's a problem. Because you have to ignore these other scriptures here or twist the meaning of these other scriptures. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Okay, um, well, see, that, 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 that was happening in Paul's day. See, he's looking for Jesus. The day is at hand. So this was actually happening in Paul's day. Then again, you're making Paul a false prophet. That's what this whole eminence thing is about. Paul was a false prophet if he's saying that this was in his day. In the latter times, we're living in the latter times. People departing, you know, some shall depart from the faith. I don't think there was much departing from the faith in the first century. They are pretty strong back then. Okay, uh, can we look at people departing from the faith today? Yes. How about uh, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? A few. <laughs> Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Never. Especially not on YouTube. You can trust anybody that uses a King James Bible on YouTube. Yeah, don't worry about it. Having their conscience seared with, hot, with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. In abundance. Why? Because we're in the latter times. Paul was prophesying a future time period. He wasn't looking for Jesus to come back in his day. Don't even tell me that he was. If he was, he was a false prophet. Plain and simple. If he was calling his time the latter times, then again, he was a false prophet. The Holy Spirit speaking through him was lying. 
apparently, I guess, according to these eminence people. Let's look at another one. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous, perilous times shall come. Well, that was Paul's day. That was in the first century. Well, then Paul was a false prophet. Paul is prophesying a future time period when perilous times shall come. Are we living in perilous times right now? Yes. But they're going to get better, I'm sure. Yeah, right. We're living in perilous times. Uh, I think that this is the time that Paul was prophesying of. Was Paul looking for Jesus in his day to come back? No. That makes no sense at all. And I'll show you the problems with it, the bigger problems with it later on. He wasn't looking for Jesus in his day. Latter times, last days, he's prophesying way out into the future. He said to Paul, how long? He would have said, I have no idea. The Lord's not showing me that. But I know it's not today. I know it's not right now. I mean, what was the life of Paul? Did he just sit around doing nothing? Well, one of these days, it's going to be the rapture. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe at midnight, maybe tomorrow at, at 3 o'clock in the... Wait, September 23rd, the blood moons are lining up. I think it's going to be this year. No. He wasn't looking for Jesus to come back in his day. If he was, then he was a liar. Because over here he's saying it's the, you know, last days thing. And then over the, here, oh, it's, you know, latter times and everything. But I'm, I'm you know, the day is at hand. The day is at hand, but there's last times out there. Last days out there and latter times out there. People get things all mixed up. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Very uh, true passage of Scripture. The time will come. He didn't say the time is here right now because... The day is at hand. You know, I mean, we just started preaching the gospel and, and I'm just busy going all over the place, just destroying my health, going around on all these missionary journeys and I'm going to this city and I'm going to there and I'm preaching the gospel over here. But the time's here. I guess we're in the last days. So the Lord's come back. I'm not going to do anything else. No, no. It's not the truth. Good, but go to the book of Acts. I'm going to show you another little thing, and this is going to really make the uh, hyper-dispensational Paul worshipers shriek in, in terror. Um, the final revelation wasn't given to Paul. Uh, what, what did you say? I said the final revelation was not given to Paul. There were some things that were not shown to Paul. Okay? Um, those things were shown to John. We'll look about that. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? See, they're looking for Jesus, you know, to come back. Well, it is, he hasn't left yet. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are we going to go into the millennial kingdom here? Is this the time when you're setting up the kingdom is what they're asking him. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Well, no, no, because see, you know, Jesus could come at any time. And we're going to see the motivation for the imminence thing. It fed the whole hyper soul winning movement. He could come back today. He could come back tonight. And unfortunately, I'm just going to have to skip ahead a little bit here, but unfortunately, I've preached this over the years because I was taught it. I was taught it in the Baptist system. It's a great soul-winning motivational thing. You, you're running out of time. You don't have much time left. He could come today. He could come before I get this thing done. <laughs> no. There's a time that he knows. How do you know? Which the Father hath put in his own power. And if you understand the biblical Godhead, Jesus Christ is the Father. In terms of the soul, the soul of God is the Father. Jesus Christ is the outward body. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit. 
these three are one. They're not three separate persons. Three separate, you know, beings that all have their own body, soul, spirit. Or there's two spirits and then Jesus has a soul and a spirit. Well, maybe he doesn't have a soul. I think he has a body and a spirit or some kind of a blending or, you know. No, man is made after the similitude of God. Man has a body, a soul, a spirit. God has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Not that difficult. But you see, the Father has put in his own power when the kingdom is going to come in. Now, was this re revealed to them? The things that are revealed to the, to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, did they know about it here in Acts chapter 1? No. It didn't happen for many years might say 30 years essentially after Jesus is speaking this is when the revelation is shown to John so they have no clue about this stuff but let's continue verse 8 but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth and when he had spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Hmm. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? You know, that's, that's a convicting question. The Lord says, uh, Go on out and spread my word. Go preach the gospel. I think it's almost over. I think it's, it could be any day now. Uh, be careful. Be careful. Um, one of the most demotivating factors out there, unfortunately, is this imminence doctrine. Because all of a sudden, you get young men saying, there's no point in getting married because the Lord's going to come back any day. Hey, there's no point in me having a job. There's no point in me doing anything else to, to fight the evil of our world and whatever because it could happen. There, there's no telling when it could happen. Um, well, yes, there is. And we'll be getting to that later. There's no way that you can set a date for it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to set a date. But brethren, it's timed out. And you are given a clue as to when it comes. We're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. We'll see about this here in a little bit. The, the, the angels didn't that came and were standing by them. They didn't commend them. I think it's good that you guys are standing here just looking up into heaven. Jesus told you to go work, but it's good that you're looking for him. It, you know, do you think the blood moons have lined up yet? Do you think the stars, the, 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 the Virgo, the Virgin, and, and, and the way that the things are you know, lining up and, the, and the, the 12 eagles or the whatever, the, you know, Let's look at the stars and see when Jesus is going to come back. Because it could be at any time. Let's not bother working or anything else. Let's just, let's just uh, say he's going to come here at any time. And the angels say, go. <laughs> Jesus told you to go work. Go work. Something to think about. Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 20. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken, of, spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, Maidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great, that great and notable day of the Lord come. So, oh, well then it, did it happen? No. Why? Well, was Peter giving a false prophecy? Uh, not really. I, I can't say totally to that because he was still saying, I think that it's going to happen. I think that the, you know, the time of Jacob's trouble and everything else is, is coming. It wasn't revealed to him, right? 
So he's just speaking as a man at that point in time. He's saying, what you're seeing here, and, and you know, understand it wasn't just all, well, Peter was just some stupid false prophet. No, no, because God was there. He was giving signs and wonders to confirm the word of the Jews. So this is a transitional book. It's why it's very dangerous for Christians today to try to get stuff out of the early part of the book of Acts. Because the Lord is saying, okay, I'm going to give Israel one more chance. I'm going to see, send some signs and wonders, speaking in tongues, miraculous healing, and you know, diverse kinds of miracles and things. The Lord's offering miracles to the nation of Israel. He's giving them one more chance. So it still is a little iffy at that point in time. It wasn't yet revealed to them, the mystery of the catching up. They didn't quite understand it. Jesus referred to it in John chapter 10, but they didn't get it. That's why in John 10 they're saying, I don't understand. I don't get it. <laughs> because they're saying, where's the, you know, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great new. Where, where's this at in what you're saying in John 10? John 10 is about the catching up of the body of Christ. Okay, the sheep hearing the voice of the shepherd and he, he calls them by name and leads them out. You know, compared to Revelation chapter 4. That's what's going on there. But right here, they're ignorant of the timing of the catching up of the body of Christ. They don't get it. They still don't understand it. And like I said, I'm not trying to say that Peter was, was I mean, technically what he was saying was false, but it was because it wasn't revealed yet to him, right? Because Israel still had a chance. Again, Peter wasn't in sin because he was doing something and God just wouldn't reveal the truth. No, he's, preaching the right thing to these Jews there, giving them one more chance. It was up to the nation of Israel. And when they firmly reject, then the Lord says, okay, Paul, um, here's the mystery. You say, what mystery? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Okay. It says here, Behold, I show you a mystery. Whenever you see a mystery in Scripture, it's talking about something that has not been revealed before. Right? It'd be kind of stupid to say this thing has been revealed over and over and over, and I'm going to show you a mystery now. Behold, I show you a mystery. Jesus died on the cross. They'd say, well, yeah, Paul, we, we've known about that for quite a few years now. <laughs> you know, uh, many of us were actually there, Paul. You know, the original apostles would have said, it wouldn't have been a mystery. But Paul says, he writes here, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. It's the catching up. You don't see this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53, you don't see it in Matthew 24, you don't see it in Mark 13, Luke 17, or Luke 21. All about the second coming. And the book of Joel also talks about the second coming. There's other things in the Old Testament. You are never going to see this mystery revealed prior to Paul speaking about it right there. And the, the lying post-trib devils will come out and they'll say, well, um, no, it's not there, but it's because the mystery is, it, Paul's talking about the same event um, it's just that he's filling in more details. They think they're so brilliant. Uh, oh, he's, he just, how do we get through this? Oh, yeah, he's filling in more details. Oh, well, then there's another problem. Um, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, I think when the sun is being you know, darkened, the moon turns to blood and the stars fall from heaven, I don't think that's in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Okay. Uh, and you say, well, the, the last trumpet, it's the last trumpet, see? The last trumpet's blown, the seventh trumpet. Um, well, that's not the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. There's seven vials that have to happen yet, number one. And number two, it doesn't say trumpet. Posties can't spell, okay? It says Trump, not Donald Trump. It says Trump. A trump is the sound, the voice of the trumpet. And if you compare it to John chapter 10, Jesus says, I call them by name and lead them out. Compared to Revelation chapter 4, John's there on the Isle of Patmos and he hears a voice as it were a trumpet talking with me. Voice of the trumpet, the trump of God. 
but see posties being lost uh, they don't understand that stuff it goes right over their head they just kind of eyes glaze over and they don't they don't get it but you see there it's a mystery that's revealed to paul well then everything has to be revealed to paul from then on right peter and the other apostles there in acts chapter 2 there were certain things that were not revealed to them but everything, the rest of the revelation of Scripture, was all given to Paul. I don't think so. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, Christ which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant Paul. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the church. Not really. <laughs> That's not what it says. It says uh, John. Um, I hate to tell you another little thing here, worshipers of Paul, but uh, I don't think Paul was even alive at this point in time. This is 90 or so A.D. Uh, Paul would have been executed before then. Huh. The full revelation of the mystery is given to Paul. No. No, it isn't. It's given to John. The end of the Bible when things wrap up. It's given to John. Verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Okay. Now, we're going to go to the key passage here which debunks this whole imminence teaching that the rapture could have happened at any time. And I'll use the term rapture. That's the catching up is the correct term term called up together with the Lord in the air. That's the correct term, but we'll just say rapture for the sake of argument, for the sake of the popular term of that most people think of when they think rapture. But I'm going to go and show you the, the main passage here, 1 Thessalonians 5, turn in your Bible. I'm going to show you the one that really destroys this whole thing of it could have happened at any time, it can happen at any time. Um, there's no timing for it and whatever else. And again, I'm not setting a date. I will never, ever set a date that the, the catching up is going to happen on blah, 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 whatever day, year, whatever. There's no indication of that from Scripture. And many people will say, well, no man knoweth the day or the hour. Uh, well, that's talking about the second coming. That is not talking about the catching up of the body of Christ, the rapture. It's not talking about that. Uh, people, that's one of the most misquoted, misunderstood portions of Scripture that there is. No man knoweth the day or the hour. That's not talking about the rapture. Okay, so uh, I understand that you want to try to use that. You say, well, yeah, but it's, it's technically true, so we can kind of, you're falsely quoting Scripture to prove something. You have to stop doing that. And if I've ever done it, I apologize. I'm not going to do that anymore. All right. It's very important to, to use Scripture in its proper context. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Is there a time that we can look to to say, okay, the catching up is coming? Or is it just any time, you know, two minutes from now, three minutes from now, three weeks from now, whatever else? It could just be at any time. It could have been, you know, 500 years ago. It could be 50 years ago. It could be, you know, what, which one is the teaching from Scripture? Let's look at what the Bible actually says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, remember, let me say this quick, chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 is about the catching up. Paul is giving a second reference to the mystery that was revealed to him in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 53. Keep that in mind. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. But of the times and the seasons of what? Of when this is going to happen. You have no need that I write unto you because, see, it's imminent. It could happen at any time, right? Keep reading. For yourselves know perfectly, know perfectly, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 
Now, when you study the day of the Lord without getting into a big conversation on this whole thing, the day of the Lord, brethren, is it basically is the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. But the day starts essentially with the time of Jacob's trouble. That gets the clock going again. Um, say it this way. When, when does a day start? It starts at midnight. Um, is midnight when the sun comes up? No, it's pretty dark at midnight. Unless you're in Alaska or something, you know, or far northern areas of Europe or whatever else. Um, midnight, it's pretty dark. Um, but it starts the day. So the day of the Lord can start with times being pretty dark. And there's a passage, we're not going to go to it, but it talks about the day of the Lord, you know, being darkness and whatever else. Um, it starts with the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what starts the day of the Lord, essentially. So that's what's being referred to. The day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Previous scriptures, Matthew chapter 24, talks about the thief in the night. But look at the contrast. And this is one of the most important things. I've always preached this. When you go through 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through down about to verse 11, you'll notice the contrast between ye, yourselves, you, you know, whatever, and they and them. Paul's contrasting between the saved, like you and me if you're born again, and the lost world, they, them, whatever. Keep that in mind. For when they shall say, lost, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with, a, with child, and they shall not escape. So somebody's escaping what's coming. It's the body of Christ. But look at this, verse 4, key verse. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. What's the day? It's the day of the Lord. Wait a second. I thought that the uh, catching up could be imminent. I thought it could have happened in 1610 or, or 1783 or at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We're not in darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. There. Hmm. So uh, what's the indicator for the when the catching up is going to happen? Um, is it just imminent and nobody really knows? It could happen at any time, could have happened at any time, could have happened in Paul's day. Or is it, know that it's actually when we see the time of Jacob's trouble going to happen very soon, we say, okay, all right, I think we're seeing it. That's what's going on here. We're not supposed to be ignorant of the times and the seasons. We're not supposed to be ignorant of the latter times, the last days. We're supposed to understand these things. But lost people bring this imminence doctrine in and they, they use it to make money. I'll show you the proof of that here in a little bit. That's what's going on. They're trying to say it could be at any time and whatever else to pressure people into their system. Verse 5. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Compare that to, Revel or to Romans chapter 13 that we read about. The day is at hand. You know, let us walk in the day. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about the day is at hand, meaning the catching up. Where it's almost here. It's ready to happen. He wasn't talking about that. Paul was not a false prophet. Things were not revealed to him in terms of the final revelation. That happened to John later on. But Paul wasn't making false prophecies because he was thinking that Jesus was going to come in his day. Verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, lost world, but let us watch and be sober. How can you watch for something if you don't know and it could happen at any time? Hey, I have a guy coming here in a little bit and uh, he's going to show up. He said he'll be here at uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon. I better watch for him. Oh, but uh, he could come at any time. How can I watch for him if he could come at any time? He just says, I'll show up sometime. Well, is it tomorrow? Mm, I don't know. I'll just show up. Maybe it could be next year. It could be 10 years from now or whatever else. 
Am I going to be watching for him? How can I be watching for the guy if he, I have no indication of, of the time period that he's coming? You see the problem with the imminence thing? When you actually sit down and you study, you say, wait a second here, this doesn't work. I'm going to show you more proof as we go through this. It doesn't work. We're to look at the, uh, the day of the Lord. That's our indicator. We can see it out there. We say, okay, we're getting closer. Like you're going down the highway and you see you're heading to some other state. Let's just say I have to head to New York <clears throat> and I'm up here in Maine and I'm driving south and I see a sign for New Hampshire. And I say, well, I must be there because New York, New Hampshire, it's close enough. You know, no, um, I'm heading for New York, but I know that I'm closer to New York now than when I was in Maine because now I just entered into New Hampshire. You see how that works? Well, as we get closer to the day of the Lord, we can say, okay, the catching up is getting closer. But somebody in 1829 can't say, wow, we are in the last days. I don't think they were in the last days. Doctrine was pretty strong back in 1829. There was no uh, nation of Israel. You know, ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and divers places and pestilences and all these other things and the, and the perilous times that, that Paul describes coming. That stuff wasn't there in 1829. So don't tell me, well, they, they could have, you know, Jesus could have come in 1829. No, he couldn't have. No, he could not have. Let me continue here. Verse 7. <clears throat> For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Again, compared to Revelation, or Romans, I keep saying Revelation. <laughs> compared to Romans 13. That's what it's talking about over there. Verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. There's a comfort there, because we know that one day we will be going to be with the Lord. And if you have to die, well, then you go up first. It's not some kind of a, oh, man, what a bummer. It won't be in our, in our lifetime and whatever else. Uh, no, it's, it's a thing that we can look and say, okay, the day of the Lord is what we're looking for. As we see that approaching, we know, okay, if the day of the Lord is here, like this with my hand, well, I'm not there yet. But if that day of the Lord starts to come, we see the mark of the beast technology forming, and we see, oh, there's some big stuff going on, some things stirring up the Middle East, and it looks like there's some stuff happening in Israel, and it's getting closer. We think, okay, now you might be able to make the argument for an imminent catching up of the body of Christ. It's getting really close now. But when you're looking and you're seeing, hey, this stuff's far out into the future here yet, um, it's not imminent. To say it is, it's a lie. But I'm going to show you the one that really ties this whole thing together. Revelation chapter 9. So well, I, just, I disagree. I just disagree. It's... It's got to be, you know, it could be at any time. There's no plan. There's no anything else. You know, just ignore Acts chapter 1 where, where Jesus says about the Father hath put it in his own power to determine when he's going to set up the kingdom. Just forget that. You know, then what do you do with this verse? Revelation chapter 9, verse 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Huh. I would say that's pretty specific. I'll read it again. Prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year. Um, if the Lord knows the exact hour, day, month, year of this event, do you think he knows when the catching up's going to happen? Say, no, brother, it could have happened at any time. We'll look at the problems with that here in just a minute. But, uh, yeah, I think the Lord knows the exact time. All right? So, uh, I'm going to draw some things on the little whiteboard thing behind me here, and then we'll be right back, and I'm going to continue to discuss this thing of this doctrine of eminence and why 
it doesn't work. All right, we're back. Here's my chart. Three rapture timing beliefs. Okay, number one, we have imminence. Two, we have church age finishes. Three, we have Tom and Jacob's trouble. T-O-J, T, time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 is the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the title. There's no title, the great tribulation in the entire King James Bible. Um, but it's pre-planned. Okay, let me explain the three here. Imminence teaches the rapture could be at any time. Just a big question mark inside this rapture here. We don't know when. And then there's an unknown amount of time before the time of Jacob's trouble gets started. We'll look at the problems with that here in just a minute. Number two, we have the church age finishes with the last soul saved. Okay? The last soul gets saved, and this is taught. You'll see a blending of the three of these uh, belief things here too, by the way, with a lot of preaching. You've, unfortunately, you've seen it in my preaching, and I'm sorry about that. I never really studied this issue all that much. I just preached what I was taught, and what I was taught was wrong. Um, I will admit that. But this last soul saved, I have a pre-trib rapture moment on that, what will trigger the rapture when it's the last soul saved. That's not true. That's not true. Church age finishes with the last soul saved. That causes the rapture, and then the time of Jacob's trouble gets started. We'll see the problems with that here in just a minute. What the Bible actually teaches is the time of Jacob's trouble is pre-planned. Revelation 9.15. Okay, let me write that here All right, as proof of it. Revelation 9.15. Kind of writing at a weird angle here. There's all the proof you need. There's an event in Revelation in the time of Jacob's trouble that is year, month, day, and hour. It is timed. It is planned. It's not flexible. The Lord isn't just, well, you know, whatever. No, He knows when it's going to happen. Um, the time is, is in the Father's power. He knows exactly when it's going to happen. Um, say more on that, but the problem number one, the imminence teaching. <clears throat> First problem that I have with it, which is why it can't be biblical. If the rapture happens and just nobody knows when, it could happen at any time. It could happen 400 years ago, 500 years ago in Paul's day, the whole thing. How do people get saved in between then and the time of Jacob's trouble? Let's just say it happens in 2021, but the time of Jacob's trouble is until 2030. Nine years of what? How does salvation happen for nine years? See, if you're a Bible believer, you understand that the dispensation ends with the catching up. And it starts the time of Jacob's trouble. You study dispensationalism. I have a whole sermon on this. Every dispensation ends with a major event. What ends the, what would be called the church age? What ends that? The catching up of the body of Christ. That's what ends it. So if up, you have this up here, church goes up, and then it could be any amount of time. If it happened in Paul's day, well, boy, you really have an interesting situation. You're over 1,900 years. How do people get saved for 1,900 years? You see the problem it makes? Problem number two People were not in the last days back in through here. So Paul is saying, in the latter times, in the last days, the time will come. Not only can they not get saved, but they're not even in the last days. So this up here is a lie. This imminence thing that it could have happened at any time and Paul was looking for Jesus in his day, that's a lie. Um, if you're saying Paul was looking for Jesus in his day, then you're admitting that Paul was a false prophet. I don't take that stand. I think a little bit more of Paul than that. All right? Paul was not an idiot like a lot of the modern day preachers. Option number two, church age finishes, finishes with the last soul saved rapture and then it starts the time of Jacob's trouble. What are the problems with that? The church controls prophecy and not God. Isn't that the truth? How do we trigger the rapture? We've got to get that last soul saved. 
Well, I mean, I literally, I have heard Baptist preachers preach that the reason we're still here on this earth is because you haven't won enough souls to the Lord. When's the last time you led somebody to Jesus Christ personally? When is it? That's why we're still here. I've heard them preach that. I've gotten pretty close to preaching that myself. May God forgive me for lying. That's not the truth. And you know, I'm probably going to have to go back through and delete a bunch of my older stuff and whatever, where I was really fervently into this last soul saved. We've got to get that last soul saved. It's not true. It is not true. The Lord already has it pre-planned. And you could say, well, in his, in his sovereignty, you know, and he knows when the last... But we can't understand that stuff. Okay? You get kind of kooky on some of that stuff. You get Calvinistic. Um, but here's the other thing. Another problem with this option number two. What if a Christian fails at winning that last soul? I mean, you know, just imagine the scene in heaven. The Lord's up there and he says, Oh, oh, oh wait a second. Uh, Jim Smith just walked into the same grocery store as, as Brian Denlinger. Oh, this could, this could be it. I could, oh, I'll just bite my nails. Oh, they're going into the same aisle. I'm so excited. This is the rapture. This could be the rapture. If Jim Smith gets saved, Brian's going to lead him to the Lord. Oh, no, Brian failed. He didn't lead him to the Lord. Oh, okay. Oh, I was so ready to do the rapture. I thought that was going to be the last soul saved. Well, I'm going to have to send somebody else after Jim Smith because he's the last soul that's going to get saved. <laughs> stupid. All right? I mean, people, you know, get, people get, oh, you, you shouldn't say stupid and fool and idiot. And they, what can I say? Okay, that's a stupid system of belief. All right? The Lord has it planned. He knows. The day of the Lord is out there. We're looking at that. We're saying, okay, it's starting to see the, the, this whole vaccination, forced vaccination. You might not be able to buy or sell unless you have the vaccination. Uh, okay. Well, the vaccination is not the mark of the beast, but it's propaganda leading towards the mark of the beast. People wearing more on masks on their faces. That's not the mark of the beast, but it's something peculiar on your face. Getting your forehead scanned with the little heat thing. It's not the mark of the beast, but it's getting closer. So we can say, oh, okay. It's not up to us to determine the catching up. We've got to get that last soul saved. <laughs> There's no scripture for that. It's just simply not there. And you're getting into a philosophical type of belief system where you're starting to say, well, okay, God, if God would know... You all get saved and you get into this Calvinistic thing. You know, the people that go to hell are obviously not elect. And so the elect people, they're forced. They must be forced to be saved. They can't have free will. And because if you had free will and it, it, you get philosophical, you're trying to figure out God's mind. You can't do that. All right. The Lord gives us a definite thing in the future. The day of the Lord. We're supposed to look towards that day of the Lord and say, okay, I remember reading a thing about D.L. Moody and he went over to, to, to Palestine at the time. There was no nation of Israel when he was alive. He died in 1899 and he went over there and he was kind of a little bit disappointed because there was no nation of Israel. So he realized the catching up isn't going to happen in my day. He didn't say, it could be today. It might be today. If he ever preached that, I don't know. He might have. He might have fallen for some of that stuff, but he was there. It can't happen in his day. There is no nation of Israel. When's it going to become a nation again, you know, Mr. Moody? I don't know. Well, if the Bible's right, are you going to be going home to be with the Lord soon? In terms of caught up together in the cloud? He'd have to say, no. The day of the Lord's not that close. And, you know, I've been called a heretic, which is, you know, kind of a daily thing for me, for most people. But, uh, oh, Denlinger's a heretic because he's going against the doctrine of imminence. Well, I'm going against the doctrine of imminence firmly, completely. I will no longer teach this doctrine of imminence. It is a doctrine of devils. Who started it? I've heard the Jesuits actually started it. I can't prove that at this point in time. Might be true. I don't know. You know, the Manuel Lacunza and everything else uh, that wrote this stuff about some of the rapture things and, and whatever. 
He might have said something about it. I, I haven't had the time to research that. But I've heard from reputable sources that the Jesuits did start this doctrine of imminence. And why? Because it starts to make people get wishy-washy. I don't have to worry about a job. I don't have to worry about what's coming because the rapture's coming. It could be here today. You see? I'm a young man. I don't have to worry about uh, actually taking responsibility. I'm just going to be a lazy slug because, hey, the rapture bailout's on its way. I'm just going to stand like the uh, apostles there in Acts chapter 1 and just look up to heaven. I think he's coming. Let's look up at the stars and see if we can get in an indication. Nobody was told to look at the stars. Okay? The day of the Lord. And the Lord gives you some pretty clear things about the day of the Lord. So, one more chart to draw. I'm going to erase this one here. And then I'll come back and I'll show you the last chart. And then we'll be done with this study. All right. Now we have the final chart here in this study. I'm going to call this the time of the body of Christ. If I could give an overview of what happened in the time of the body of Christ. Church age is, I've used it. And, and I might still say it in the future. I'm not trying to say it's heresy if you use church age. But it's problematic because there are churches in the time of Jacob's trouble. Church is just a called out assembly. There's also the church in the wilderness mentioned in the book of Hebrews, which is a reference to the Jews coming out of Egypt in the Old Testament. So it's called out assembly. So to say the church age, it's not really clear. But one thing we do know is people in the Old Testament were not part of the body of Christ. People in the time of Jacob's trouble are not part of the body of Christ either. We are today, the body of Christ time. All right? But how's it start? Small churches, meaning people, meeting in houses. You read about it all throughout the New Testament, all through the Pauline epistles, I should say. Okay? Small churches meeting in houses. Persecuted and isolated believers comes next. It goes from there down into persecuted and isolated believers. As the gospel started to be preached, the Jews rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, and they started to persecute the Christians. The Apostle Paul being one of them when he was called Saul, changed his name to Paul. Saul was a big part of that, persecuting Christians. He was there when Stephen was stoned. Stephen who said, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. See? They started to persecute the early believers which isolated them. So you would have groups of early Christians going and moving out into the mountains and things like that, getting away from populated cities, getting away from the political rule of the day, and doing their own thing, making copies of the scriptures, handmade copies of the scriptures, and passing down the traditions that they had been taught in the New Testament. All right? Not extra biblical revelation. So this is how the thing works. Go from persecuted and isolated believers down to missionary and evangelism work. The Waldensian people of northern Italy would actually go into Vatican City during the Dark Ages and witness to people. Now, they came in as silk merchants or whatever other types of, you know, just selling wares and whatever. And they would say, you know, would you like a copy of the New Testament to somebody? Or some page of the New Testament, not the New Testament. Excuse me. Some part of the New Testament. Would you like this? It was basically the precursor to modern-day tracting. But they would write out the scriptures on a piece of paper, and then they would say, oh, you know, here's this beautiful piece of silk. And by the way, have you ever seen this? And they would witness to people. So they were a small, persecuted, isolated group of people, and they would go out and do missionary and evangelism work. Okay? It's not that the church was somehow part of Roman Catholicism, merged with Roman Catholicism, and then later came out as the Protestants or something. That's Catholic uh, teaching. No, Christians were always there as persecuted and isolated believers. The same thing today. If you say, I am a King James Bible believing Christian, they'll say, you're a Protestant. No, I'm a King James Bible believer. I'm not a Protestant. I don't want to reform the Catholic Church. I want to see it eliminated. <laughs> looking forward to it. Um, oh, you're a Protestant. You have to be a Protestant. No, I would be what you would call a heretic, the heretical sects that, that were there. And again, if you don't understand what the Catholic Church did down through the centuries, they would go after groups of people, early groups of people, and they would say, 
they're heretics. We declare them heretics and we're going to take them and put them to death and burn all their materials. And then we'll write the history about those people. Uh, Jacob Sibelius, I think the guy was named, the Sibelianism. You'll see that condemned in Catholicism and they say he taught heretical views of the Trinity. And you look at what he taught and yes, it's not Bible, what the Bible teaches, but here's the problem. None of his writings exist. So we really don't know what he taught. Uh, the Pauliceans, the Donatists, the whatever. You have to rely on Catholics to tell you what those quote-unquote heretics once believed. Their writings don't survive. Nice little game that the Catholic Church plays. But these are the groups that were around doing missionary and evangelism work. Small, persecuted, isolated believers doing missionary and evangelism work. And eventually, some of this stuff got out to men like John Huss, Martin Luther, some of these other guys, and I've even heard that Martin Luther, a lot of his writings that came out supposedly attributed to him were actually written by the Catholics to demonize the man. Quite possible. Okay. The Catholic, I mean, look what they do to me. You know, all these papists out there, how much they lie about me. I mean, go to Rational Wiki and look at some of the stuff that these papists have, have written about me. So Rational Wiki is an atheist website. Then why are they quoting church fathers to, dis, to be, debunk me? Why are they defending the Catholic Church? I think uh, if somebody's an atheist, they wouldn't defend Roman Catholicism. <sighs> you know? Yeah. Okay? I mean, if they're lying about a guy that's still alive and trying to mess up me and lying about me, what makes you think that they're not going to do about it the men in the past like Martin Luther? Interesting. So what these people did, a lot of the early persecuted, isolated believers going with their missionary work, they started to get to some powerful people, which started to cause some rebellion and some protests. And all of a sudden, the just shall live by faith. Hey, Roman Catholicism, you're not telling people to live by faith. You're telling people to live by sight. Worship the Pope. Go do the sacraments. Go to your church. You see? Hmm. So people start protesting. Protestant Reformation in the 16th century when it really got strong. Yeah, of course, you had John Wycliffe back in the 14th century in the early 1300s saying, I want to actually make a translation of the scriptures into English. Didn't use the right text or whatever because it wasn't given out yet and things. It wasn't given to Erasmus, but which happened in the 16th century. Um, but you had John Wycliffe and he's basically saying, I'd like to have the people, they should have their, the scriptures in their own language. You know, and not in modern street lingo or something either. No, he's meaning it shouldn't be just Latin for the, the clergy in Roman Catholicism. It should be there for the common man to read. See? Started to cause some rebellion and protests, which led to freedom from papal tyranny. All of a sudden, people are co coming out and saying, hey, you know what? I just got a copy of, of Wycliffe's translation. Hey, you know what? I just got a copy of the Tyndale translation and I, I read through that whole New Testament and there's not a word about the Pope. It doesn't say anything about sacraments. It doesn't, the word Catholic's not even in the New Testament. Hey, uh, Father so-and-so, where's the word Catholic at in the New Testament? Well, you shouldn't have that book. That's, that's wrong. Hey, you know what there? Father, by the way, that's condemned in the New Testament. The words of Jesus say, call no man father. You're not supposed to have religious titles. I don't need you anymore, you stupid little papist priest. Well, you'll be excommunicated from the church. Good, good. Excommunicate me. Heretic, we'll burn you at the stake. You have to catch me first. Rebellion against papal tyranny. We need that today, don't we? Papal interdict all over the earth, all the rulers and the things and, else, and everything that are subservient to the Catholic Church. Shut your economies down. Mask the people. Silence them. Yes, Pope. That's what they're doing. We're going back to the Dark Ages again, if you haven't figured that out. Freedom from papal tyranny starts to lead to outdoor revival meetings. All these different preachers coming out and, and things and, and these different guys and they're saying like George Whitfield and, and uh, you know, um, John Wesley and things. 
these guys and they're coming out and they're they're trying to start preaching in churches. Uh, Roger Williams was another one. And they're saying, hey, you, you can't preach those things in here. That goes against the official state church. Because Church of England was just basically the Anglican church was a break off of the Catholic church because King Henry VIII wanted to marry more wives. And, you know, the Pope wouldn't let him. So he said, okay, I'll make my own church. <laughs> uh, not all this protesting down here and freedom from papal tyranny. It wasn't all used for good purposes. I mean, again, we have to clarify that. Um, a lot of the Protestant Reformation, you know, splinter groups were basically just steam valves for Roman Catholicism. But, uh, but uh, you know, you have all these preachers and they're coming out and they're saying, I'm going to preach these things from my pulpit. I'm an official ordained clergyman in the Church of England. I'm going to preach this. And they say, you can't preach it. And then they say, okay, I'm going to go out into the open air. And open air preaching turns into revival meetings. Hey, why can't we preach outside? Why can't we preach out in this tent out here? Why can't we, uh, or in this field? Hey, you know what? Let's set up a tent. Let's start to preach. And you see all the old paintings and all the old pictures of these guys out there and they're preaching up, you know, standing up on some, you know, soapbox or standing up on the, on the street corner and they're preaching, they're preaching the word of God and they're, you know, yeah. Outdoor revival meetings and it caused massive revival and quite a bit of uh, anti-Catholic sentiment because people didn't want papal tyranny anymore. I'm not going to go into some stuffy, big Roman Catholic cathedral and have to go into some dirty pervert in a confessional box and tell him what I've done wrong and he tells me what I have to do. I don't think so. I'm not interested in that. I'd rather go out and hear some real Holy Spirit-led preaching from the Word of God. The King James Bible, by the way. If you use an NIV or a New American Standard or an ESV or whatever else, you're using a Catholic translation. All right? King James Bible is the Bible that these guys use down here, the outdoor revival meetings. But in time, the devil starts to get in there and the devil starts to say, hmm, how do I stop this powerful movement? Well, you know, brother so-and-so, we're going to have this revival meeting, um, but it's getting kind of cold. It's getting into December and starting to get a little cold. What should we do? Why don't we start building buildings and calling them Churches, just like our uh, Catholic uh, friends <laughs> do. Hmm. But but we won't build them big and, and elaborate. They'll just be. We'll call them meeting houses. We'll just we'll just build a little barn out back or a little little place out back, and we'll, it won't have a steeple on it. We promise. We promise. It'll just be a meeting house where people can go. On Sunday from 9 to 12, just like the Catholics do. Okay, but but we can do it. We can, you know, somebody stands up and says, uh, where's it at in Scripture? Well, it's not there, but, but it's okay. We can do it. We won't go as far as the Roman Catholics did. We won't have big cathedrals. We won't have elaborate big uh, marbled floors and everything else. Indoor church buildings come in. I would say probably, I mean, you can go back into the, you know, 1700s and whatever else for the Baptists. Um, Roger Williams congregation eventually, you know, had a state lottery to build a church building. You can look that up. A lot of them had, you know, they would call them steeple houses. They didn't want to call them churches at first because of the fact that people were reading their Bibles and they would say, wait a second, churches are people meeting in houses. Churches are people meeting out on the fields. Churches are people meeting in the tent or in the cave or in the wherever. Don't call a building a church. So the early people started to say, let's just call them steeple houses. Let's call them meeting houses. Preaching shed. Literally. You can look that up. But as time went by, they started to get into church buildings, more and more church buildings. And, and let's, let's uh, Madison Square Garden, let's, let's, let's rent that out. And this, this big carnival ground over here, this big building over here, oh, it's a glorious place, and we'll, we'll get in D.L. Moody. And we'll get it. We'll, thousands of people in here. We'll bring in Billy Sunday. We'll bring in J. Wilbur Chapman. And we'll bring in all these great revival preachers and Sam Jones, the Freemason. <clears throat> Never mind that. And these guys will stand up there and say, I want to preach to you today the Word of God. And, th and they start doing the whole circus performance. And guess what happens? Ching, 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 ching. That money starts coming in. 
one of uh, Billy Sunday's best friends that would actually come and hear him preach. He'd sit in the congregation, John D. Rockefeller. They were good friends. You know what I mean? Good money. So guess what started to be preached? The eminence doctrine. A lot of the revival down here led into the church buildings and they started to say, we're turning so many things. We're shutting bars down. We're seeing people getting saved like crazy. We're seeing all these changes. The rapture must be soon. We're doing such a good job. Jesus has to come back soon. And hey, if we're going to grow this thing and get bigger, I mean, you know, if we could get more people in here. I mean, we had 10,000 people last week. Did you see the tithes and offerings from 10,000 people? Ooh, man, we could do some big work with this. Um, how can we get more people into our buildings? Let's get these bigger revivals going. Oh, wait, you know what? I've been hearing some talk. They'd actually like to start to meet together on a weekly basis. Can you imagine that? 10,000 people meeting together on a weekly basis? Think of that. Money? <clears throat> How are we going to do this? We need universities, seminaries, and more church buildings. Let's build them bigger and better. And some of the people probably said, I uh, thought you said you weren't going to call them church buildings. I thought you said you weren't going to copy Roman Catholicism. Oh, but brother, for the, for the greater glory of God. I thought that was a Jesuit that said that, but... We won't go there. Look at this. We can't stop this work. It's, it's just going crazy. We, Billy Sunday preached and he got prohibition passed. Alcohol is illegal. Never mind the fact that it was actually used to get rid of the bootleggers and actually make a, mo a monopoly among alcohol production in America. We won't look at that. We won't look at the fact that Billy Sunday was a Mason, Freemason, and was just part of the government. And he got people to go to World War I and young men to go in and he promoted the military because nobody else promoted the military in churches ever again. Never mind that they fly the American flag with the gold fringe, the American military ensign in church buildings. Don't look into any of it. Just ignore that stuff. Um, see, the money started to come in. And all of a sudden they realized the little uh, golden goose that lays the golden egg, we'll say, um, was the eminence doctrine. And I've preached it. And I'm sorry. It was wrong for me to preach. Friend, you don't know when the Lord's coming back. He could come today. You might not have tomorrow to come. The Lord Jesus Christ could be coming at any time and you'll miss your opportunity to be saved. And, which isn't even true. People can get saved in the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, I've heard that from Christians too. Well, if Christians aren't in the... In the great tribulation how's anybody going to get saved huh <laughs> have you read the book of revelation they're getting saved um they don't need us the lord doesn't need us to lead people to the lord okay he's going to have plenty of other ways to do it in the time of jacob's trouble when the body of christ is gone but you see in its doctrine it's imminent it could be soon friend what are you doing with that big bank account of yours what if Jesus were to come next week and you have all that money in the bank? Why not give it to the work of the Lord so we can build more churches and more buildings and more seminaries and more universities and make this movement go up? Because after all, we have to get that last soul saved. You want to see the last soul saved, don't you? Well, then come forward to the old-fashioned uh, <coughs> offering plate and uh, put in that big check. The rapture's imminent. It could be at any time. And it's up to you. It's up to you and me. We have to do the soul winning because without us, the Lord just, he can't make it happen. We have to get that last soul saved. You see how the whole thing worked out? Universities, seminaries, and more church buildings because of the eminence doctrine, bringing all that cash, all that money in. What's it lead to? Persecuted and isolated believers. Uh, Pastor, if I could have a moment of your time. Oh, it's nice to see you here. Uh, just, just hold on one minute, uh, sir. I, uh, young man, I'm, I'm, you know, as agreed, everybody here. Uh,
okay it's, it's nice oh yo, mrs jones i love your hat this week oh that's so pretty oh what was it that you wanted uh, um, pastor i just have a quick question um I, I heard somebody say that churches actually met in homes and things and and uh i don't really see any scripture for church buildings okay young man i, I appreciate that yes uh, it's nice to see you again this sunday um we'll have to talk about this some other time but you don't 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 bring this stuff up okay that's divisive right have you seen that um pastor i why are you using an niv why are you correcting the king james bible with what you call the greek um you know what if you don't like what i'm preaching you know what there's the door buddy this is my church this is my pulpit nobody tells me what to do in my church You see, all of a sudden, you're isolated. Then you say, all I wanted to do was just stand for the Bible. Can, can we preach this in Sunday school? No, we have literature. Sunday school literature that's been pre prepared for us from the university. Our Sunday school materials come from Bob Jones University. Don't deviate from the Sunday school materials. It's heresy. I thought that's what the Catholic Church does. Traditions of men keeping the scriptures from the common people. I thought that, you know, it's kind of weird. Right back into it. Right back into it. And what do we have? Forced back into small churches, meeting in homes. Whoop! Full circle. But this is what the, uh, the little dynamite that really blew things up. This is the thing that really made this whole system over here just explode. That's what got the money in. That's why it's so important to the devil. Not important to the Lord. The Lord looks down and says, yeah, I really have no idea. I already have it all set. What about that last soul that needs to be saved? Well, guess what? If they blow it... Let's say the, the catching up is going to be uh, January the 7th of 2028. Just trying to prove a point here. I'm not setting a date. January 7th, some guy in the, early in the morning, and he sees a gospel tract. He gets witness to it, and he goes, eh, whatever. And the rapture is set for 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And somebody else comes to that man, and they say, you need to get saved. Ah, shut up. I don't want to hear about it. 3 o'clock comes. There's no tarrying. There's no waiting. There isn't anything. The Lord's going to say, time's up. Boom. And up we go. And that man that uh, ignored, well, you have another chance now. As long as you didn't have pleasure in unrighteousness, you have another chance. If you have pleasure in unrighteousness, God sends them strong delusion. But uh, you get this guy, you know, oh, I'm just not ready. I'm just not ready. Catching up happens. Guess what? That man now has another chance to get saved. The Lord wasn't waiting for him to get saved so he could have his permission to, to cause the rapture to happen. It's not it at all. That man has another chance to get saved, but now it's going to cost him his head. Now it's going to be much more difficult. Now the soldiers come around and they say, we have to come out and clean up what these terrorists did. These weird, this weird call of these Bible believers. You're not with them, are you? The Bible says that they are beheaded for the witness of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus, and for the word of God. Oh, you believe the King James Bible? You're with that group that did this horrible thing and all these little children disappeared and things? You're with that? You would actually align with that group? Guards, guards, get this man. Take him off. We're going to give you one more chance to worship the beast in his image and take his mark. Will you do it? Are you going to still cling to your, your fake system of belief in that old King James Bible? And that guy's going to say, Boy, I sure wish I would have gotten saved back before this all happened. But now I have no other choice. I'm looking at that bloody old guillotine right there and I say, I'm not denying Jesus Christ and I'll not deny the very written words of God, the King James Bible. And they say, take that heretic and cut his head off. They'll have a chance to get saved. Of course they will. 
We're not waiting for the last soul to be saved, brethren. The Lord already has it planned out. And you say, what was the importance of this? Well, here's the thing. I preached about this this last summer, 2020. It's 2021 right now. I preached about it and I said, I'm seeing a lot of people using the rapture as a bailout. Well, I have all these debts and I have my marriage has fallen apart and I have all this sin in my life, but it doesn't matter because the rapture is imminent. We'll be out of here soon. I don't have to think about it. Well, and I'd say to these people, well, what about the time of Jacob's trouble? It seems like it's pretty far out there yet in the future. The mark of the beast technology, the whole system, it's kind of out there in the future. There's no rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. There's a few other things that kind of make me think it's not going to be this month, you know, the start of the time of Jacob's trouble. And they say, oh, it doesn't matter. The rapture's imminent. You're going against Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says we're supposed to look and watch and be sober for the day of the Lord. We're supposed to look out there and say, wait a second here. And when we see those things happening, when we see the war and everything else and, and things that's going to set up that time of Jacob's trouble, then we can say maybe that it's you know imminent. It could be any day now because we're so close now to the Antichrist showing up. Okay, now you might be able to use the thing of saying it could be at any hour. But right now, I don't think we're that close. I think we have quite a few years yet. How long? I can't set a date. I have no idea. But my point I'm trying to make is you better take care of some things in your life. You better serve the Lord with your life. Don't just give up. Don't just say, well, rapture is going to happen any second. So I'm just going to be like the apostles there in Acts chapter 1 and just look up to the heavens. He's coming back any second now. And I'll tell you right now, there I can't tell you how many times I have thought that very thought and I should have built this and I should have done that. And I think, why bother? This has to be the year. This has to be it. And if I could have gone back and spoken to myself back then, um, I would say, well, do you believe the second you know, the, the time of Jacob's trouble is going to get started real soon. What about this? What about that? Well, yeah, probably not. But I think the rapture is going to happen any second. Doesn't make any sense. We're supposed, excuse me, we're supposed to look out at the day of the Lord. And as we see that approaching, say, okay, my exit is coming up soon. You ever been on a long trip and you'll see these signs for the state where you're going 300 miles away? Well, I won't be there in five minutes. 150 miles away, 90 miles away. You start to get a little bit, okay, maybe I should be a little bit more vigilant here, start looking more for my exit. What's the name of the, the number of the exit? Exit number 777. You know, um, what are we at here? Well, about 1,582 exit. Well, we have a ways to go till we get to exit 777. But it's getting closer. Stay busy. Stay busy. Um, we aren't going to have to fight the evil because the Lord's taking us out of here any second. No, I think we're going to have to fight the evil. And that's another problem that this whole thing right here caused. Because this whole thing, it was all about winning souls. Have you ever heard that? Let's all win souls. We have to win souls, win souls, win souls. Get out there and knock those doors. You know, school bus, you know, bus ministries. Let's get this. Let's get soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. Um, what about the corruption? Ah, don't worry about the corruption. Soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. Um, is that true that Jack Hiles, Pastor Hiles over here is messing around with his secretary, Jenny Nishik? Doesn't matter. He's a soul winner. Soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. You see? We've gotten into such a rotten condition because everybody got messed up on this doctrine of imminence. Don't bother cleaning up anything. Don't bother with whatever because we have to win that last soul. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, there's no date that we can set. The Lord knows the date. But uh, we have to look out towards the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the time that we're looking out towards. 
um, the Lord's not going to come back just at any time and boy, hey, look at this or whatever else. And don't try to set a date for the time of the Jacob, time of Jacob's trouble and whatever else. I mean, who knows what a year is going to bring forth? You know, go back in 2019 and say, 2020, we're going to see all these weird things happen with face masks and all the other pandemic stuff. Nobody would have believed you. You know, no way. Uh, what's going to happen this year? A lot of things can happen. A lot of things can change. <clears throat> I mean, the time of Jacob's trouble could get started before real long. Again, we have no idea. But right now, it's not really ready for everything to be implemented. Uh, I really do think that they're going to have to have the temple built first. Uh, don't tell me that they can build the temple and have it done in three and a half years, as elaborate as they want to build it. Um, I don't think that they're going to get it done in three and a half years for the Antichrist to sit there and declare himself to be God and to be worshipped. I just don't feel that way. Some people disagree with me. That's fine. Um, you say, well, you're setting a date then. I'm not setting a date. Not at all. I'm following the scriptures. And the scriptures say, I'm not to be ignorant. I'm to watch and be sober. Watch for what? The day of the Lord. That way I know, as the day of the Lord's getting closer, okay, now the time of the body of Christ ends. So, and, uh, and I'll say this yet too. This is where it's back to. So we go down through the circle then. Again, we come down into here. And by the way, uh, the rebellion and protesting, remember this. Revelation chapter 7, there's a great multitude which no man could number that gets saved in that time of Jacob's trouble. So instead of just quitting and giving up and just saying, well, Rapture is going to happen. We're leaving. Don't bother cleaning anything up. Don't bother fighting. Don't bother getting outspoken because the rapture is going to happen. Instead of doing that, why don't we get more radical and more fierce in our fights against papal tyranny and just say, you know, I'm going to leave this world with a mark and not, not the mark of the beast. I'm going to make a mark on this world. Say it that way. Make a change in this world so to speak. I mean, it, it just disgusts me. I see so many lost people that are out there fighting and willing to die for the truth and the Christians are hiding in the little church buildings, the professing Christians, hiding in their little church buildings. We're hiding. Even, you know, people that worship at home, whatever else, we're hiding. Why? Why? Because of the doctrine of imminence. That's why. So that is going to be it. Please do pray about these things. Um, repent. If you've fallen for this teaching um, because of me, I'm sorry. I will not be teaching it anymore. And if anybody out there, if you can point to any sermons where I've said that in a sermon and it's not something, just a quick mention or whatever, it's been a real driving theme of the message, it, it, you know, you're running out of time and whatever, let me know and I'm going to delete the sermon. Plain and simple. I will not keep that false teaching up. This doctrine of imminence thing, it is not imminent. The Lord knows when it's going to happen. And it's not up to us. <laughs> okay? So that is going to be it. Please do keep us in your prayers. Thank you for watching.